I just put out a video called Gear I Wish I'd Never Sold, where I talked about over the years the gear that I'd acquired and then for whatever reason had slipped through my fingers and I really missed them. And at the end of that video, which of course you should check out, it's linked below, I suggested the idea of doing a video called Gear I'm So Glad I Sold and you guys made yourselves heard. I heard you, here it is, here is that video. And just to say before we get into this, I encourage you to let me know your gear that you just couldn't wait to see the back of. I really can't wait to see, uh, to read all of your uh, comments down below. Uh, I'll, I'll be down there. Now I've timestamped all of those bits of gear. You can just skip and watch the ones that you wanna see, no problem at all. I'm also on the long winding path to 100,000 subscribers and it would really make my day if you could reach down and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, it helps the channel and puts a smile on my face. I appreciate it in advance. I thank you. These videos are also not sponsored, but they are made possible by my Patreon backers. Any funds from Patreon I put back into the channel, I buy gear, I review it, and then I give the gear to my backers. If that appeals, it's a great way to support the channel and um, you can find out more below. I feel like a preemptive apology is necessary to the brands I'm gonna mention. They, uh, I, I like all the brands, they all make good gear. The reason, my reasons for getting rid of them uh, are just, they all come down to matters of personal preference and um, I'm not trying to be unkind, I'm not trying to upset anyone and I just, you know, this video is purely just for entertainment and I hope you enjoy it. We're kicking off with a lens and it's the Samyang 35mm f1.4. I'm talking about the original manual focus version before Samyang had any autofocus lenses in their range. And incidentally, that's the first reason I'm glad I sold this. And I'm not opposed to manual focus. It's just that, you know, f1.4 plus manual focus. And, you know, let's be honest, you're a young video guy, you get a lens which, you know, lets you go to f1.4, you're gonna try and shoot video at f1.4 and just, these things are just not friends. It was also reasonably heavy considering it didn't have an autofocus motor, but the main reason for getting rid of it was the horrific focus breathing. I mean, kind of unacceptable focus breathing. The field of view would change so much through the focus range. At infinity, it was true 35 millimeters, but close up, it was way tighter than 35 mil. I found it jarring when moving focus points, so it had to go. Next, we have a polarizing bit of gear and it's the full fat USA made Gibson Les Paul standard. And this may be shocking to some people that, you know, this is a, a bit of gear that I kind of couldn't wait to see the back of. But now I'm a former Les Paul owner, I can kind of see 2020 crystal clear that it just wasn't a good value product. Mine had blemishes on the finish, the pickup selector switch was sticky almost immediately, the fretwork was shockingly bad with spiky frets all over the place, the fretboard itself was rough feeling, which is not what you want, but the biggest gripe I had, drum roll please, and we can say it together, it never stayed in tune. And some will comment saying, yeah, but that's always the case with Gibson Les Pauls, as if some history of producing a product makes that okay. We're talking about a product that's north of two grand to buy. How is that okay? Think about that for a second. Why would anyone buy a premium product if it's commonly known not to work properly? Imagine if it was, uh, if you were buying something like a car, for example. Imagine a new car salesman saying to you, yeah, this is a great car, you know, a hefty price tag, obviously, but you know, um, and oh wait, there is one thing. You won't know when, but it will stop steering just for a bit. Um, but you know what, it's, it's fine because it's a classic, it's been made for ages and it looks cool. Les Pauls have now been in production since 1952 and it kind of boggles the mind, doesn't it? How have Gibson not fixed this already? I, I, you know what, I'm, I'm so glad to be free of Gibson. Ooh, that's gonna get some dislikes. Next we have another lens and it's the Sigma 105 f2.8 macro. Do you remember this one? before, I think before any of the art series came out. Now, optically, I kind of like this lens. I like the look that it gave me and um, it was not bad, but I would say practically speaking, it was tougher to live with. This lens again had unspeakable focus breathing, which, you know, for me as a video guy, it's just harder to live with. The other thing to bear in mind is this had amazing 
amount of noise that came from the optical stabilisation uh, motor, I guess it is. Yeah, this is back in those days. Needless to say, these are things that had me gladly parting with this lens. And you know what? To this day, I am still looking for a really good uh, macro lens for video purposes. Recommendations, please. Moving on to the next one that just had to go, and it's the Slate VSX headphone system. And for the video guys who understandably won't know what this is, it's a set of headphones that come with software that simulates the sound of being in different spaces like recording studios, mastering studios, cars, clubs, on a boombox, on a phone, so that you can check your audio is gonna to translate to all types of speaker. The problems I had with this were that I really didn't like the headphones themselves. Plus, I found the experience of listening in these emulated rooms to be really not believable or enjoyable for that matter. Some people will love a VSX and swear by it and that's cool. It's just for me, I, I couldn't live with it and uh, so it had to go. And actually, if you want to dive into this more, I have done some videos on this and um, they really go deep into the subject. And, and actually, I think I came out the other side with a far better solution, which, um, yeah, you'll have to watch the videos and find out. And then we have the Shure SM7B. And before I get a barrage of comments about this, I like the Shure SM7B. It's a good microphone but I tend to prefer it on guitars, uh, less so on vocals, and that's only because I just find the sound to be just less interesting, and that's all. I owned one for years, but in the end sold it because, you know, as I was doing more and more video, um, and you know what, I'm actually not a fan of mics like that being visible on screen, so nowadays I use a condenser mic and I hide mine right there. Um, because I do this and prefer the sound and I don't want it to be visible on screen, I thought it was time to move on. I have just a couple of other thoughts about the SM7B. I, firstly, I don't actually think it's a great value microphone. And I only say that because when you look and see what else you can get on the market, it's kind of unbelievable. For less than the Shure SM7B, you can get something like the Lewitt Ray, which continuously adjusts its bass response depending on your proximity to the mic. That's unbelievable. Or the Audio-Technica AT4033A, which I no longer own, but is actually one of the best mics I've ever heard. Again, if this subject is interesting, I have lots of other videos that I think you'll really enjoy, so I will link some more below for you. Next, we have the Rode Wireless Go slash Wireless 2 range, and if anyone asks me about these, I say they look cool, not a fan of how they sound. Now, I'm not sure what's going on with these, but as a former audio guy, you know, it's what I studied, it's kind of my foundation, I would say these kind of straight up just don't sound very good. And I think what's happening is because they look cool, I think there's a little bit of some people listening with their eyes. The other thing is they have unacceptably large and heavy transmitters. They weigh in at over 30 grams each. And when you look at other uh, wireless transmitters, which you know I've reviewed a few recently, and they've all been around eight grams, nine grams. It makes a huge difference. It's frustrating when you see people wearing these all the time, and they're just heavy and uh, just weighing down their clothing so much. And I also think they're far too visible on camera. So I will never buy another Rode Wireless series product until the form factor improves and the sound quality improves. Then we have the SE Electronics VR1 ribbon mic, and for non-audio nerd people, uh, a ribbon mic is where a very thin, extremely thin piece of metal is suspended in between two magnets, and the way that it captures sound is very natural, almost like the human ear, and it has a kind of similar effect. It rolls off the top end, you know, the, the, the treble frequencies, and just, people always use words like, you know, warm and uh, natural, like that. The VR1, on the contrary, being a very modern interpretation of a ribbon mic, captures a lot of treble. And what I found was it had all of that top end, but without the kind of transient attack that you'd expect that comes with it. It's a really strange combo. I tried it on everything you could imagine, and a lot of people love this mic and um, I don't want to 
you know, no one's wrong for using it or loving it. Uh, it just didn't give me the sound that I had in my head. That's all. Anyway, that's it for now. I just hope you found my list interesting and helpful. Um, I'm curious to know what yours are. Please let me know gear that you are so glad that you saw the back of and um, it's going to make for interesting reading down there. I'm I can't wait. I've now made hundreds of videos about videography and audio, of which the algorithm has chosen this video for you to watch next, and the one underneath is my most recent video. Until next time, let's help each other out and shoot a better video. See you guys.